Great, uh, Jason, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this press conference. Last spring, as the world was shut down by the coronavirus pandemic, there were predictions that the dramatic decline in pollution and emissions could lead to permanent changes that uh, may just save our planet from climate change. Well, of course, we now know that uh, that's, uh, that did not prove to be the case. The International Energy Agency estimates that after carbon dioxide emissions dropped globally in 2020, emissions quickly rebounded and were 2% higher in December 2020 compared to December 2019. The pandemic may have temporarily interrupted the scale of global carbon emissions, but it didn't create the kind of lasting change that we need. Now, there are plenty of proposals in Congress to address climate change and encourage more sustainable practices. I support many of them, but we need a robust plan to cut carbon emissions if we want to have any chance of really saving the planet. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Plan is a market-based solution that will achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and drive the transition to cleaner energy uh, sources. It uses an aggressive fee schedule starting at $15 per metric ton of CO2 and increasing uh, $10 per year. That'll get us a 95% reduction in harmful air pollutants by 2030, which is particularly important for the communities who have long suffered the downside of pollution, disproportionately low-income households and communities of color. There's growing momentum in the House. In this Congress, we have 28 original co-sponsors, including the four co-leads who we'll hear from shortly. Compare that to last Congress when we had only six original co-sponsors. The House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis' 2020 report laid out the benefits of a carbon fee policy, stating that, quote, until the market reflects the true cost of carbon pollution, the U.S. economy will remain biased toward fossil fuel combustion, close quote. There's also support for a carbon fee in the Biden administration. Treasury Secretary Yellen told the Senate Finance Committee that, and I quote again, we cannot solve the climate crisis without effective carbon pricing. The president supports an enforcement mechanism that requires polluters to bear the full cost of the carbon pollution they are emitting, close quote. The private sector is catching up too. Just a few, week, few weeks ago, the American Petroleum Institute endorsed an economy wide price on carbon, the most impactful policy for emissions reductions. But what makes our plan different is the dividend. Recently, the Washington Post editorial board urged Congress to implement a carbon tax and use the revenue to fund infrastructure projects. But as I wrote in a letter to the editor, carbon tax on its own is regressive and would burden poor and middle-class families by increasing gas and utility costs. Our plan returns 100% of the net revenue back to the American people as a monthly dividend payment. And by 2030, that would amount to $1,470 per adult per year. The dividend program is crucial to ensure the cost isn't simply passed down to hardworking Americans. In fact, it ensures that families could cover any higher energy costs and still have funds left over to support themselves, particularly as our country recovers from the pandemic economy. As I said, climate change is complex. There's no single solution, but this plan will curb carbon emissions. It will reduce pollution uh, and it will help drive the transition to cleaner energy alternatives. Uh, I call on my colleagues to support this effective plan to curb rising emissions and to address a major contributor to climate change. And uh, with that, I am honored to turn it over to my friend, uh, Representative Scott Peters. If Representative Peters. Yeah, I'm trying to get my video on. Uh, Jason, can we check on uh, yeah. Representative Peters' video? There we go. There. You go. Oh, it's, okay. There we go. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ted, and thanks to you and to uh, Representatives Shu and Chris and the other leading supporters of this critical bill uh, for participating in today's call. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. Um, at the outset, I want to I want to knock down a, a false argument. We sometimes hear that um, people people say that a, a carbon price is not enough. Look, nobody argues that a price on carbon is a silver bullet that solves the problem on its own. But a price on carbon is indispensable and has to be considered a central component 
of our national strategy to combat ch uh, climate change. Putting a price on carbon sets an immediate monetary incentive for all Americans, individuals and industries alike to reduce the use of fossil fuels and reduce carbon emissions. We can't save the planet without making every single person an actor in this crusade and placing a price on carbon provides that incentive. Some worry that a carbon tax is regressive, but as um, Congressman Deutsch explained, this bill that we introduced today returns revenues to Americans' pockets while curbing the adverse uh, impacts of burning carbon. This is the most progressive way to offset the cost of a carbon tax and is a game changer to drive the energy markets towards cleaner energy sources. Uh, those of us who represented the United States at the UN Climate Change Conference COP25 in Madrid in 2019 heard this over and over again. Markets need clear price signals to transition to a low carbon economy. Why is that? Because a price on carbon incentivizes producers and consumers of carbon intensive goods without any further government action to use less fossil fuels and to substitute lower carbon alternatives. And we need to get our own house in order on carbon pricing if we are to presume to tell the rest of the world how to behave on climate policy. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act boasts wide outside support and is one of our most feasible climate strategies. Conservatives like Senator Mitt Romney and the Republican-led Climate Leadership Council have publicly recognized the merits of carbon tax and dividend policies. And as Ted mentioned, within the last couple of weeks, the American Petroleum Institute endorsed a carbon, uh, an economy-wide price on carbon. With this new openness to considering a carbon tax among industry and Republicans, it's irresponsible to dismiss the carbon tax because of any presumed political difficulties. It's exactly the opposite. And a price on carbon is essential if we're adequately to fight the climate crisis and compete in a global economy. This bill is poised to reduce emissions, empower markets to transition to a low carbon economy, and immediately work to slow uh, climate change. Now is our chance to harness the growing support across the political spectrum at one of our best shots at saving the planet. And the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act could very well be the bridge that gets us there. The cost of inaction is too great for our planet, for our national economy, and for our standing as a world leader. So we hope we act on this bill today. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague from California, Congressman Judy Chu. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad to be here to celebrate the reintroduction of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act of 2021. I've been proud to be a co-sponsor and advocate for this crucial legislation since Representative Deutsch first introduced it in 2018. And I want to thank him for his continued leadership on this issue. The cost of emitting greenhouse gases, both for our own health and the planet's, has always been high. And we've paid that price in higher rates of respiratory problems, more frequent storms, devastating wildfires, soaring temperatures and rising seas. But while we suffer more and more of the consequences, those responsible do not. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act would fix that by ensuring that polluters pay a rising cost for their emissions, driving down greenhouse gas pollution and returning those proceeds to taxpayers every month. This is a progressive solution that ensures workers and families come out ahead while making our economy cleaner. I'm also pleased that this year's version of the legislation meets the goals set by the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis last year when they recommended that the U.S. adopt a carbon pricing system. It's designed to meet our economy-wide emissions reductions targets, and it creates a level playing field for American companies competing internationally, ensuring that low and moderate income households come out ahead and it protects the EPA's ability to regulate emissions and protect the most vulnerable environmental justice communities. This bill, this bill alone will not defeat the climate crisis, but it promises to be one of our most powerful tools at our disposal as we work to rapidly remake our economy and lead the world in reducing emissions. And I especially want to thank the passionate and knowledgeable local advocates who've push this legislation from a simple idea to a leading proposal in Congress. And I'm particularly proud of my Pasadena Foothills chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, which has worked closely with me for years to advance this bill. 
the opportunity before us today is historic as we finally have a president and Congress working together to advance creative and bold solutions to the climate crisis. We're, we are urgently making up for lost time and we need legislation that ramps up quickly and sets aggressive yet achievable goals. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act does just that and I look forward to what working to get it across the finish line this Congress. And now I'd like to turn it over to Congress member Charlie Crist. Great, thank you, Judy. And uh, thanks to my friend and colleague and fellow Floridian, Congressman Ted Deutsch, for introducing this and for your leadership on this important bill, Ted. And a big thank you to everyone for joining us here today. I think I speak for all Floridians when I say that the climate crisis is at the forefront of our minds. In the Sunshine State, we feel the effects of climate change each and every day. We're seeing hotter temperatures, more flooding, increasingly dangerous hurricane seasons, as well as rising sea. Florida is literally ground for the climate crisis and we need to act now to protect our beautiful state and all coastal communities. Reducing our nation's carbon dependency is key to winning the fight against climate change. That was clear to me nearly 15 years ago when I hosted Florida's first national climate summit and sought to limit emissions as governor, along with Governor Schwarzenegger of California and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But it's even more clear today. Continued inaction will be catastrophic to our environment, our economy, and the well being of all Americans. That's why I'm proud to once again take this historic action by joining my colleagues on this call to reintroduce legislation that will tackle one of the biggest contributors to climate change. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is common sense legislation that puts a price on carbon emissions, makes polluters pay, and turns around and gives that money right back to the American people where it belongs. Allowing our country to take effective steps towards curbing carbon emissions and putting money into the pockets of Floridians and Americans is a win-win for everybody, especially during a pandemic when so many Americans have struggled to make ends meet. Without this legislation, Americans will continue to pay the price of the climate crisis, including more severe storms, and other natural disasters that will wreak havoc in the places we call home. This is an opportunity for us to do right by our environment and be good stewards of the planet we have been blessed with. Thank you all, please stay safe and God bless. Uh, thank, thank you, Charlie. Um, and uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Madeline Parra from Citizens Climate Lobby uh, for some comments that she'd like to make. Great, thank you, and hi everybody. I'm Madeline Para, president of Citizens Climate Lobby, and Citizens Climate Lobby is a national grassroots climate organization with more than 180,000 supporters, organized in over 450 U.S. chapters. First, of course, I want to thank the co-sponsors of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act who are here on this call, as well as the 25 other co-sponsors who put this legislation forward. We at Citizens Climate Lobby are excited to see momentum building for this policy, which we see as a critical step to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and stopping climate change. We applaud these members of Congress for meeting the moment and responding to their constituents. During the last Congress, our volunteers held 2,896 lobby meetings with congressional offices to ask for big, bold climate solutions. More than 1,000 of those were virtual as we continued our advocacy even during the pandemic. Today, Representative Deutsch and his colleagues are showing how democracy should work. They're being responsive to their constituents and confronting the big problem of climate change head on. Since this bill's original introduction, Citizens Climate Lobby volunteers have been spreading the word about it and building support for it in communities across the country. They've generated endorsements from 1,003 local businesses 140 faith groups, 135 local governments, and 743 prominent individuals in their communities, including the local elected officials, church leaders, business owners, and more. And that work continues. We're eager to help advance this legislation by continuing to build even more support and momentum for it. 
Later this year, we'll be back on Capitol Hill in person to encourage additional members of Congress to step up and co-sponsor the legislation. Our volunteers are already reaching out in their communities with the good news of this bill's reintroduction, and we'll continue to seek new endorsements. It's exciting to do all of this work because the policy is such a meaningful one. It will put America on the path to a clean energy economy in a way that protects regular Americans through the transition. So thank you again to the members here today and your colleagues for the courage and leadership that you've shown in introducing this important bill. Uh, thank you, Madeline, and, and thanks to all of the grassroots activists from Citizen Climate, Citizens Climate Lobby around the, the country uh, who have engaged on this issue from the beginning. We're really grateful. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Mormon from the Evangelical Environmental Network. Uh, Dr. Mormon, please. Well, good morning. Again, my name is Dr. Jessica Mormon, Senior Director for Science and Policy at the Evangelical Environmental Network. We represent over 3 million pro-life Christians who have taken action with us over the last five years, calling for action on the climate and pollution crises. At EN, we are grounded and guided by scripture and informed by science in our mission to ensure every child has the hope and expectation of a stable climate and a healthy pollution-free world to grow and thrive in. I wanna thank Representative Deutsch for his continued leadership, advancing market-based solutions and fiscally responsible solutions to the climate crisis. We thank him and the other co-sponsors for introducing the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This is a solution that will deliver real results on reducing carbon pollution, all without, place, all without placing undue burden on low-income and working-class families hit hard by the pandemic. As evangelical Christians, we are called in scripture to be good stewards of God's creation, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to serve the most vulnerable and overlooked in society. In the 21st century, fulfilling our Christian witness and mission must include acting on human caused climate change that is fueling the extreme weather that we are already seeing devastate our families, businesses, and communities across America, and to reduce the burden of fossil fuel pollution that prematurely takes the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans each year. That includes our children, both born and unborn. Caring for creation and acting on climate change truly is a matter of life. And if we don't take the full into full account the full costs of carbon pollution, we will continue to subsidize dirty energy with the health and lives of Americans, especially the most vulnerable that the Bible specifically calls us to defend. That is why at EN we applaud Representative Deutsch and his co-sponsors for reintroducing this important bill. We support this and other market-based carbon fee proposals that correct this critical market failure that finally take into account carbon pollution's detrimental costs to our health and the environment. We're especially pleased with this bill because it's not only an effective plan for advancing a clean energy transition that will reduce carbon pollution to levels needed to avoid widespread dangerous climate change, but most importantly, because it protects and safeguards low-income and middle-class Americans from price increases. The poor and middle-class should not shoulder the burden of creating a healthy and clean energy system in the U.S. and creating the clean and healthy future that our children deserve. And this, in bill, this bill ensures that they will not carry that cost. We also applaud the bill for ensuring that American businesses stay competitive on the world stage by making sure the playing field is level, by imposing border carbon adjustments on goods and materials imported from other nations that don't include, have these similar market corrections for carbon pollution. 
So we look forward to working with Representative Deutsch and the bill's sponsors as it goes through the legislative process and to make sure that proposals that put a price on carbon, like the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, are both a cost-effective solution to the climate and pollution crises that can catalyze the deployment of clean energy infrastructure and also give our children that bright and healthy future that they deserve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mormon, uh, and uh, thanks again, uh, Madeline. Thanks to my colleagues, uh, Representative Peters, Representative Chu, and Representative Chris. Uh, and just quickly before we turn it over, uh, before I turn it back to Jason to uh, to guide us through questions, um, I just wanted to take a moment. I wanted to do this at the start, but let me just take a moment now uh, to uh, acknowledge the uh, the passing of our colleague Alcy Hastings. Um, Alcy was as uh, all of us know, was a, a fighter for so many things that he believed in. And as Charlie referenced, um, Alcee understood the importance of a beautiful Florida and the threat that climate change posed. And, um, and as, we, uh, as we remember him for so many things, let's remember him for his efforts to, to fight climate change and to preserve the beauty that we have here in Florida and, uh, and in our world. Um, Jason, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Our first question comes from Brian Dabbs of the National Journal. Uh, hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, and so sorry to hear about uh, Representative Hastings. I always really enjoyed speaking with him and, and that's devastating news. Um, but uh, on a on this topic, uh, thank you very much for, for hosting this. Um, Representative Deutsch, can you talk about why you chose to nix the Clean Air Act regulatory suspension? Um, and do you think you can garner Republican support or industry support for the legislation as is? Sure. So on, um, on, on your second point, uh, the bill is originally drafted with a group of Republicans that we consulted with, with economists to ensure that the, uh, the price levels on carbon would be high enough to encourage a transition, but not so high that it would stop economic growth, as Dr. Mormon pointed out. Uh, we've been in discussions with several Republicans about the legislation. They haven't yet signed on as co-sponsors, but we couldn't wait to reintroduce the bill. The administration and Congress have been discussing climate change policy. We believe the carbon fees have to be a part of those conversations. So we'll continue talking to our Republican colleagues. We had uh, Republican co-sponsors <laughs> in the past, and I'm confident we will again. As to uh, the moratorium, the bill, you're, you're right, the bill no longer contains the provisions that put this regulatory mor moratorium on Clean Air Act provisions. Um, we had done that in the past, and it was designed to protect businesses from double jeopardy of both carbon fees and regulations on, on carbon emissions. Um, but it had a, a backup that would permit the EPA to step in if, if the uh, emission reduction goals weren't being achieved. We took that out now because of the changes that we've seen. The business community has moved forward on this issue. They've determined that they can operate with, uh, with carbon fees with and with targeted regulations. So many businesses already include the price of carbon in their uh, internal numbers. Uh, businesses have been adopting these fees as part of their future business plan, so it's necessary for us to move forward. So th this is just a reflection, I think, of where we are um, at this moment. And I, I don't know if any of my colleagues have comments on that as well. Jason? Yep. Our next question comes from Josh Siegel with the Washington Examiner. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I am, I'm wondering, I know you said that you did cite, you know, Janet Yellen saying that she's for a carbon price. You know, John Kerry's mentioned that, but, you know, Gina McCarthy, the White House climate advisor last week did a, a call with the press and, and she made clear that President Biden prefers a clean electricity standard that was included as part of his infrastructure proposal. So my question for you is, are you prepared to oppose the infrastructure package if, as is, it goes with the clean electricity standard as, as the main vehicle to reduce emissions uh, over a carbon price? Is, is that, I mean, you know, with your amount of co-sponsors, you would have the ability to, 
you know, given the slim margins of Democrats in the House to, to stop this bill, if you thought that a carbon price should be a part of it. And a lot of people actually think the carbon price is more of a natural fit for infrastructure and, and you know, easily done through reconciliation. Um, well, the reason that we're, the, the reason we've reintroduced this, the reason that we're having this, this discussion now um, is to make sure that the a price on carbon is a part of these conversations. I, I familiar with the comments that, that you refer to. Uh, I also know, as, as I referred in my earlier comments, to uh, senior officials in the administration who, um, who have acknowledged that a, a price on carbon is important here. So we're at the, at the early stages. I think it's premature to talk about what, uh, what we're, where we're ultimately going to go. We believe strongly that this, is, that this needs to be a, a part of the plan to change behavior and to, and to help us make this, take the significant steps that are necessary uh, for us to dramatically reduce carbon emissions. Uh, and I think this works well with the president's plans, which again, we look forward to, to ongoing discussions uh, to ensure that, that we can continue to, to have this as part of those, of, of those discussions that ultimately we hope is part of the plan. Can I, can I comment too, Ted? Of course. Um, I, I, um, I'm also very conscious that uh, President Biden has been careful to say that we're at the early stages. He welcomes our input and he expects the plan to change. For my own part, I've indicated that I can't imagine a climate policy um, portfolio that could be effective without including a price on carbon. And I've told him that's, um, that's a priority for me. You told him that personally? What's that? I told, them, told, well, I told my, yeah, I told the Biden administration that they asked what my priorities were. This is, this is, um, this is one that I named that I didn't see. And I told them that was, that was a concern to me. But what do you, oh, sorry. Okay. Our, sorry. Our next question comes from Mitch Perry with Bay News 9. Mitch, are you there? Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. The question actually was already asked. I was going to ask Congressman Deutsch about getting GOP support. He has talked about working on that. Uh, I know you had Francis Rooney from Naples as a co-sponsor on this a couple of years ago. And I, uh, how important is that for you to, to get that? Well, obviously, um, given the the broad support for uh, for a carbon fee. Um, Throughout, I mean, you, the, the, throughout uh, the country, from environmental groups and and um, and religious groups and uh, business leaders, uh, senior administration officials, we wanted to move forward so that this would be uh, part of the conversation. As I said before, it doesn't preclude us from stopping the ongoing efforts to uh, to bring. Uh, Republicans into this. They, they're they hearing the same thing from Citizens Climate Lobby. They're hearing the same thing from Dr. Mormon's groups. They're hearing the same thing from environmental groups and from business leaders in their communities and across the country that this is an indispensable part of uh, a serious effort to combat climate change. So we're confident ultimately there will be uh, Republicans who, who step up to support this effort. Thank you. Our next question is from Emily Meredith from Energy Intelligence. Hi, I was just wondering, this is in line with the question on the um, clean energy standard, but if you could talk a little bit about, you know, in the Clean Future Act, there's a proposal for a clean energy standard that's backed by a carbon fee. Um, and I, I understand that's different, but if you could talk a little bit, you know, about precisely why you prefer the upfront carbon tax versus an energy standard backed by a carbon fee? That would be really helpful. Well, we, I, I'll just, I'll, I'll offer just a word. And then if my colleagues want to jump in the the idea that the importance of, uh, of, of the carbon fee is first certainty. We don't know the, the extent, we don't know what the standards look like. Um, we know from the research what the carbon fee, what, what impact the carbon fee will have, the revenue that it will raise, our ability to refund that revenue uh, directly to uh, American taxpayers, uh, and 
uh, and how it will change behavior. So there is a, a certainty here that um, that that makes this particularly appealing. But I, I'll I'm happy to defer to Judy, Charlie, Scott, if you have comments. I would just say, um, you know, it, 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 there, there's not necessarily an inconsistency between the two. A lot of it is in the details of how, how you, um, you work them out. California, we, in California, we do have a carbon pricing system. It's a cap and trade. It's not a fee standard. Um, we think they go pretty well together. So, again, we're at the early stages. We're encouraged by the Biden's um, outreach for ideas. Uh, this is one that's obviously very important to us, and I think we can figure out a way to make it work. Jason? Yep. Our next question comes from Antonio Fins with the Palm Beach Post. Hey, thanks for taking the question. So while this debate goes on, um, you, know, you do have a lot of grassroots effort to try to address cleaner energy. In fact, here in Palm Beach County, there's yet another new solar co-op um, that's uh, signing up customers. Uh, so does this at all directly or indirectly bolster any of these grassroots efforts and making it more cost effective? Does it help them in any way? Well, ultimately, Antonio, if we, uh, if we put a price on carbon, the, I, the idea is to ultimately change behavior. Um, it's going to make those sorts of, of uh, cleaner alternatives uh, more appealing. So, uh, yes, there will be a, 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 direct, a direct link between uh, what we're doing here and what also what um, uh, customers want, what consumers want, which is to look for these opportunities to take their own actions to impact climate change through alternative forms of energy. Okay, is there, are there any other reporters that wish to ask a question? No, then Congressman Deutsch, I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, great. Well, I am, I'm really grateful to my colleagues for joining and, and Madeline, Dr. Mormon, we're, we're grateful for your support of these efforts. Uh, this is, as, as I said before, this is uh, just the, the start of what is a really uh, important and exciting conversation about a serious step that we can take uh, to, to reduce carbon emissions so that America can lead uh, toward the protection of our planet and um, and we'll look forward to continuing this with our other colleagues and, and with so many of, of uh, so many other groups around the country. Uh, any, anyone else want to offer anything else before we close? Ted, it's um, Charlie. I just want to yeah. thank you uh, again for your leadership and, and everything that you're doing, uh, and as well as our other colleagues on, on the line. Um, it's such an important issue. You know, we're dealing with a difficult situation in Tampa Bay right now with this Piney Point disaster. And, you know, this falls into that category of doing what's right for the environment and protecting Florida and America and preserving a bright future for, for all Americans and for our world. So God bless you, Ted. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Judy, um, Madeline, Dr. Mormon. And we'll see everyone soon. Thanks again. Thank you, Ted. Thanks.